Amen. Thanks so much. It's so good to be here. Um, I've known your pastor for uh, a very long time. I think I said last time I was here, uh, I met Pastor Stefan, Pastor Bailey, when he was about 17. And um, that dude is a preaching fool. <laughs> I, um, we used to have at the church, my home church, New Song Bible Fellowship. Um, we used to have a choir uh, retreat every year. I was a choir director and minister of music. And um, well, actually, at that time, just the choir director. And uh, I kept hearing about this young man who went to Liberty University, um, who was very, very, very uh, talented and gifted. And um, uh, so we would have choir retreat. We would bring in a special speaker every year. And uh, so this one year, uh, someone said, you really need to get this guy, Stefan. You really need to get this guy, Stefan. And he came, and he blessed our socks off. I'll never forget, he spoke on a good and godly choir. And um, that was the first time I had heard him speak. Uh, definitely wasn't the last time. Uh, but then I got to hear him uh, play. I don't even sit on the organ anymore um, because of Stefan. And, uh, but he's, uh, he's, he's, he's very gifted, uh, very godly, um, him and his wife, Shanita. Um, so just thank thankful that I'm able to fill in today for him. And uh, just a little bit, a uh, very little bit um, about me. I was uh, born in, well, I was born in D.C., raised in Tacoma Park, right outside of D.C. So I grew up in Prince George's County, um, lived in Prince George's County most of my life, live in Woodbridge, Virginia now. And um, uh, I'm, I'm not very crazy about Northern Virginia and that traffic, uh, but uh, that's where God has us for now. Hopefully we'll be making our way across the bridge uh, later uh, this year to come back uh, to Maryland. Um, I was serving, actually what brought me out to, what took me out to Virginia, I was executive pastor and worship leader um, at a church, in uh, Falls Church called Victory uh, Community Church, which um, actually uh, just uh, closed their doors. Um, so pray for that community. Um, pray, for, uh, uh, pray for the community there. Um, they closed the doors in, in January. And um, so uh, I'm a pastor without a home. <laughs> no, not really. It's not really a sad thing. I'm, I'm just kind of chilling at Zion Church in Woodbridge and uh, helping them out and just kind of resting. Sometimes you need to rest in ministry. Sometimes you, you need to take a little pause, and I believe that was God's way at least for me and my family, to be able to take a little pause. But we're so glad to be here. Um, and uh, if you open up in your copy of the scriptures to Luke chapter 9, Luke chapter 9, and I believe we may have it on the screen. I'm not sure. Um, I'll be reading from the New Living Translation. Luke chapter 9, beginning in verse uh, 18. And we'll read down to verse um, 27. Luke chapter 9, beginning in verse 18. From the New Living Translation, it reads as follows. One day Jesus left the crowds to pray alone. Only his disciples were with him, and he asked them, Who do people say I am? Well, they replied, Some say John the Baptist, and some say Elijah. And others say you are one of the other ancient prophets risen from the dead. Then he asked them, but who do you say I am? Peter replied, you are the Messiah sent from God. Jesus warned his disciples not to tell anyone who he was. The son of, son of man must suffer many terrible things, he said. He will be rejected by the elders, the leading priests, and the teachers of religious law. He will be killed, but on the third day, he will be raised from the dead. Then he said to the crowd, if any of you wants to be my follower, you must turn from your selfish ways, take up your cross daily and follow me. If you try to hang on to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake, you will save it. But what do you benefit if you gain the whole world? But are yourself lost or destroyed? If anyone is ashamed of me and my message, the son of man will be ashamed of that person when he returns in his glory and in the glory of the father and of the holy angels. I tell you the truth. Some standing here right now will not die before they see 
the kingdom of God. Go back to um, verse 23. Then he said to the crowd, if any of you wants to be my follower, you must turn from your selfish ways, take up your cross daily, and follow me. If any of you, say any, wants to be my follower, you must turn from your selfish ways, take up your cross daily, and follow me. We're entering into a season uh, as our country, in our country, um, they call election season. And as I watch, I haven't watched a whole lot of it. I've been following on uh, in the news and, and reading up on different things. I've seen a couple debates. But as I look on both sides, Democrat, Republican, our country is in a lot of trouble. It really doesn't matter who's elected this year. Our country is in a lot of trouble. And I've been watching on Facebook and watching some of my fellow brothers and sisters just blast the candidates. And uh, I agree with some of what they say, disagree with some of what they say. But my concern mainly is not for the state of America as much as I love this country. I know we got folks saying, let's go back to Africa. I ain't going to Africa. <laughs> I do love this country. As faulty as it is, this is where God has placed us. My main concern is not for the state of the country. My main concern, as much as I'm concerned about our country, my main concern is for the state of the church. Because when Jesus, before Jesus left, he said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. The gates of hell will not prevail. Yet we see hell prevailing on each and every street corner. Each and every community. Every state. And in a lot of churches. We see hell prevailing. And I want to submit to you today that the reason why the country is in the state that it's in is because we as followers of Jesus Christ have not taken the mandate that he's given us and lived out to the fullest the mandate and mission that God has given us. We have no right to point to the Republicans and no right to point at the Democrats and say you're not doing what you're supposed to do when we have not done what God has called us to do. He said, go into all the world and make disciples of each and every nation, teaching them to observe what I've commanded you, and I'll be with you always. We haven't done what God's called us to do. But I believe even at this late state of his late stage of history, that we can begin to do what God has called us to do. But it begins, listen, not so much with a church, it begins with people, it begins with one person. Each and every one of us, when we decide to follow Jesus and understand what that means in his fullest, I believe not only does God change us, but he changes our family, he changes our community, he changes our churches, he changes our state, he changes our country. He can change this world, but it begins with us. Now, I just want to ask you a question. What does Jesus want? Because we hear so many people saying that they're saved and they're Christian, but what is it that Jesus really wants from us? And I believe this passage talks about specifically what it is. If we, we take some three things into account, that we will understand and be able to live out this mandate that Jesus has given us. We read the passage into your hearing, so I won't go back and read the whole thing uh, again, but it's very interesting to me that uh, this chapter in the book of Luke is very pivotal in the life of Jesus. In the beginning of this chapter, he sends out his apostles uh, to preach the gospel. He preach, sends them out on the preaching circuit uh, to preach the gospel, to go into different communities. They come back and they let them know um, just how that went. We see that uh, uh, King Herod 
uh, wants to know who this Jesus is. He's already killed Jesus' cousin, John the Baptist. And he says, wait a minute, I killed John the Baptist. Who is this guy that's working miracles? Who is this guy that people are following after? And the Bible says he kept trying to see who Jesus was. A little bit later than that, uh, Jesus performs a great miracle, and he uh, feeds 5,000 uh, men plus women and children. And he's leaving. This passage, does, and Luke doesn't tell us where he's coming from, but in other passages, he's walking from Caesarea Philippi. And he asks his disciples this question. He says, who do the people say that I am? The crowds are talking about me, but who is it that they say that I am? What are they saying about me? And let me just submit to you, I, I guarantee you that the people around you, the people around you have some uh, idea and perspective of who Jesus is to them. If you listen closely to people, if you talk to people, you'll find that, that, that people have various uh, ideologies about who Jesus is. And so the disciple says, well, some feel like you're uh, John the Baptist risen from the dead. You're Elijah come back or one of the great prophets. And then Jesus asked him this question. He said, but who do you say? It's my followers. Who do you say? And listen, before we can make any kind of impact in our community and our families, we need to settle that question, who is Jesus to us? Who is Jesus? Who, do we really know who he is? Do we really know him? And of course, if you know the passage, the Bible says that Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the one sent from God. Then the passage goes on to say that uh, Jesus began to teach them many things and teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things must be rejected by the elders and the priests and the scribes and the leading uh, teachers in that city. He'll be killed, but on the third day he'll rise again. Now, this passage doesn't tell us, but in Matthew and Mark, we know that Peter pulls Jesus aside and begins to re rebuke Jesus. Stop saying that. Heaven forbid that anything happen to you, Jesus. And Jesus says, get away from me, Satan, because you're a dangerous trap to me. And then he says this. He turns to his disciples and to the crowds, and he says, if anyone wants to be my father, here it is right here. Here it is right here. What does Jesus want? What is it that he wants from us? See, sometimes I believe we, we, we come to church and, and, and not here, I'm sure, but in other churches, um, the, the, the pastors and preachers and just kind of preach like, and, and you can be sitting there saying, well, I'm, I'm here. I, <laughs> I'm here. I like to be. I want to assume that you're here and that you want to follow Jesus. That's my assumption today. My assumption is that you're here and maybe life has beat you up. Uh, maybe you've gone through many things. I'm just like you. I've gone through a whole lot. But listen, I believe you're here because you want to know what God wants you to do. You want to hear a word from God. I believe that today. What does Jesus want from us? The passage says, verse 23, if any of you want to be my follower, here are three things that you must do. Now, I want you to pay close attention because if you miss these three things, if you miss these three things, your life can be totally opposite from what God wants from you. You know, uh, uh, one of my favorite teachers, uh, Chuck Swindoll, says, if you boil life down to the nubbies, what exactly is it that God wants from us? And he says these three things. He says, first, you must turn from your selfish ways, your past. Some of your, your translations may say deny yourself. Second thing, take up your cross daily. And the third thing, follow me. So let's start right there, exactly what Jesus says. He says, if anyone wants to be my follower, if anyone wants to be my follower, here's the very first thing you must do. You must get off the throne of your life. He says, turn aside from your selfish ways. Now, let me just back up just a second and, and let you know. So now, if you talk back to me, I know you're paying attention. I know you're listening. I, I, I took a little fall a couple weeks ago, and uh, in that fall, I broke my glasses and, and getting some more. Um, so I can't see you too clearly, but I can hear you. <laughs> if you talk back to me a little bit, I know you're paying attention. If you don't talk, then I'm just going to speak longer. And uh, what time we normally get out of here? Yeah, so... So it would behoove you <laughs> to let me know that you understand what I'm saying. He says, if any of you want to be my followers, the very first thing you have to do is get off the throne of your life. Your passage may say, deny yourself. Somebody say, deny yourself. Deny yourself. Oh, there you go. They want to go, don't they? <laughs> they don't want me preaching through lunch. He says, get off the throne of your life. Each and every one of us are predisposed to take care of number one. 
All of us. Now, listen, he's not talking to a group of people who are uh, annoyingly self-absorbed, narcissistic knuckleheads. He's talking to people just like you and me, normal people who go through the everyday stuff of life, but we're predisposed to take care of number one first. But Jesus says, if you want to be my follower, you have to turn aside from your selfish ways. Well, Jesus, what do you mean? How am I selfish? Listen, I don't know about you, but, you know, I may not be the most attractive man. Notice I said the most attractive man. I may not be the most attractive man, but if I walk through, through a department store and I happen to see a mirror, I might just stop and just look. All of us are predisposed to think very highly of ourselves. But not do we think, not only do we think very highly of ourselves, we will always, it's our default. We will always, first and foremost, take care of ourselves first. Jesus says, if you want to be my followers, you have to learn not only to put me first, but to put others second. We have to live from a state of mind. In fact, I heard someone say this just a couple weeks ago, and I love this. I, 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 I want to get a, a, a bracelet or something and, and, and put it on it that says, I am second. We have to live with the mentality. In fact, someone asked Jesus, what is the first and greatest commandment? Jesus said, the first commandment is this, that you love the Lord your God with what? All your heart, all your mind, and all your soul, all your strength. That you love God first and foremost with everything you have. But then he said, the second is like unto it, love your neighbors as you love yourself. Now, I don't know about you guys. I just want to be transparent. I know sometimes for me it's very difficult. It's very difficult. Like I said, I live in Northern Virginia, and I deal with this traffic all the time. And sometimes, you know, I'm so thankful, so thankful that God doesn't have a recording device in our cars. (laughs) Because some people just drive like fools, and I find myself, I'm not careful. Now, I won't cuss out loud. I, I won't, I won't, I won't. <laughs> but some people drive like bats out of hell, and you're just like, man. You know, be, but listen, but if I know me, if I'm not very careful, in fact, as a matter of fact, I used to have road rage, something bad. I used to be the worst when it came to road rage. I can remember times years ago, this is B.C., before Christ, I can remember chasing people through the street just because they cut me off. And I'm thinking, I don't know what I'm going to do when I catch up to them. I'm not a thug, but I just want to let them know, and I'd be chasing. It was crazy. We're so predisposed to look after ourselves. But you know it even in your own life, even in your own life. And I don't know what it is with you. I don't know. See, God knows you, and you know you. I don't know what it is with you, but think of that thing that's, Deep down inside, even right now, God is saying, yeah, he has his fingerprint right on that thing. Yeah, that thing right there. That thing right there. Here's the bottom line what Jesus is talking about. He's talking about surrender. 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 Not just of things, but of ourselves. See, when Jesus says deny yourself, he's not saying deny who you are at the core of your existence. He's not saying deny who I've, cre- who I've created you to be. He's saying turn aside from your selfish ambitions that would lead you to put yourself first and not to follow me with everything that you have. To be willing to give up anything that would keep you from fully surrendering yourself to me. To live with your hands wide open and not clasped over things that would keep you from surrendering yourself to me. He says, deny yourself. This word deny is a strong word. It's a military word. It's a military word. It was used uh, for, for military armies that would stand in opposition to their enemies and to drive them back. It's a strong word. He says, you should so not want to put yourself before me in such a way that you're willing to do whatever is necessary to put me first in your life. Any basketball fans here? Deny could be a basketball term. If you think of someone, if you think of, of uh, who's the tall basketball player? Who's, who's the real tall guy? 
Anthony, Day, Anthony Davis, or somebody like that. If you think of, 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 of a basketball player and you go and you drive down the lane and you go to layup, and he not just pins your shot up against the backboard, but he throws it up into the 30th row. He's denied your shot in such a manner that you don't even want to go down that lane anymore. He says, deny yourself. We have to learn to have hearts that are bowed before God. In such a way that we recognize that he is the king of our life. Now that's foreign to us. Because we live our entire lives. I remember being young and thinking I can't wait to grow up and get out of my mom's house. I can't wait till I become an adult. Where I can do my own thing. Where I can do anything that I want to do. Do everything that I want to do. I'm going to pick on my, my son this morning. We were driving here and I put on... My son has always been, I love him, he's, he's very compliant, very obedient son, very proud of him. He wears my name very, very, very well, but he does make me laugh. So we were driving this morning. He's always been uh, the type of person that wants to figure things out for himself. I remember we were young, and we were, we, well, he was young, and I would go to dress him, and I'd put his shirt on, and he'd say, Daddy, I do it, I do it myself. Say, okay, go ahead. Put your shirt on. This and three, four buttons. Shirt be all like this. But it's a learning process. He still sometimes likes to do his own thing. I love his individuality. We, 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 we're, we're very competitive. Whatever team I like, he likes another team. As soon as he got into sports, I was so glad. I'm like, he's going to be a Cowboy fan. Yes, indeed, I love the Cowboys. I say he's going to be a Cowboys fan. He said, I'm going to be a Ravens fan, Daddy. Baseball, root for the Red Sox. I said, oh, he's got, I got another Red Sox fan. I'm going to root for the Yankees, Daddy. <laughs> so we're driving this morning, and, and I, I knew, of course, knew how to get over the bridge, but after that, I didn't know, so I put the GPS on. And every couple of minutes, the lady is like, please move over to your left lane. He's like, ugh. I didn't say anything at first. So every couple minutes she'd come on, please follow the road. He'd be like, oh. And I'm like, what is wrong? He's like, I can't stand her voice. I don't want to hear her voice. I'm like, but you don't know where to go. <laughs> He's just like, I just want to figure it out. I'm like, we can't afford to figure it out, buddy. But, you know, that's the way we are. And Jesus says, listen, turn from your selfish ways. You'll never, listen, you'll never be a fully devoted follower of Christ. You'll never know what it means to enjoy life at the fullest the way God intended it to be if you do not learn how to relinquish control of your life and to get off of the throne of your life and to bow down to him as king and authority of your life. King of my life, I crown thee. It's not phony. It's not bogus. See, my bowing lets him know that I know who he is. He's God and I'm man. He's king and I'm servant. He knows all things and I know very little. He's all wise and and, and I don't know much. He's all powerful and I'm very weak. King, God, Yahweh, I bow, I bow, I bow, I bow before you. Jesus says, if you want to be my follower, you turn aside from your selfish ambition. Turn aside from your selfish ways. But then he says something else. He says, not only do you turn aside from your selfish ambition, not only do you get off the throne of your life, which which goes to the heart of our individuality aside from Jesus. Now he talks about our identity aside from Jesus. He says, not only do you turn aside from your selfish ways, but you take up your cross and follow me daily. One of the greatest tragedies in the church, in the New Testament church, has been the gospel of name it, claim it. Has been the gospel of wealth and prosperity. One of the greatest things that has wreaked havoc on the church mentality is the idea that God always wants me to be well and never to be sick. God always wants me to have money and to never be in need. God wants me to always have the very best things. God never wants me to be lonely. God never wants me to suffer. God never wants me to cry. Listen, that's heaven. 
There's a reason why the Bible talks about our hope because we hope to have those things. See, heaven is the land of no more. No more sorrow, no more tears, no more heartache, no more broken arms and broken hearts, no more cloudy days. That's the land of no more. But while we're here, we're still in the land of some more. As long as we're in this life, Jesus said, you will have tribulation. There'll be cloudy days. There'll be rainy days. There'll be uh, lonely days. There'll be days when you're in one because that teaches us to depend on who he is. If we have everything that we want and everything that we need now, we'll never learn to depend on him. But more specifically, what Jesus is talking about is our, our identifying with his death and his resurrection. His suffering, his cross. I, I, and my son has a, has, a, has a nice cross on his chain. I, I've got a chain. I lost my cross. We wear crosses as jewelries. We sing about the cross sometimes not have any earthly idea what the cross really represents. See, in the first century, they never would have, if they wore jewelry, they never would have wore the cross. The cross was an instrument of torture. The cross was something to be ashamed of. Criminals were crucified on crosses. There weren't good people did not die on crosses. The cross in that day was, was, was like the electric chair today. It was a very terrifying and very brutal death. You didn't die just from the loss of blood. You died from asphyxiation. Because your, your lungs would fill up with fluid. And you, you, you're hanging on this cross and you have to push up to get air. And you not only die from the loss of blood, but you die and you're choking on your blood. It was a very brutal way to die. You'd already been beaten halfway to a pulp. You look like mess and you're on, on this cross and you, it took you usually a day or so, sometimes more, to die. It was a very terrible way to die. Now, remember, this is before Jesus is on the cross. So the disciples don't know exactly what he's saying. He says, take up your cross daily and follow me. In other words, listen, there will be times in our life where God calls us to go through situations that may not be enjoyable, that may not be fun, that may not be uh, what we would pick for ourselves. Jesus didn't pick the cross. As a matter of fact, in the Garden of Gethsemane, he said, Father, if it be your will, take this cup from me. But nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. See, we're taught to run from suffering. We're taught... To, to pad ourselves so that we never have to experience pain. We never have to experience things that, that, that would cause us heartache, things that would cause us uh, 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 pain and, and suffering. We're taught to run from those things. But Jesus says, no, if you're my followers, I want you to take up your cross. Identify with my death in such a way that people know that you are my followers, that people know exactly who you are. See, followers in that day were known for following. They were known as sort of like looking at a UPS driver, and you know exactly who they are. They got their brown shirt and brown pants and shoes, and they drive a brown truck. Anybody that drives, that drives that brown truck and looks like that, you know they're a UPS driver. Mailman. If I said, what does your mailman look like? What does he wear? A light blue shirt and, 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 and charcoal gray pants, and they got an eagle on their shirt. They drive a postal truck. You know that person works for the UPS post service, post service, right? You know by the uniforms how many Redskins fans we have in here. You know you got that, 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 that Indian on the side of the helmet. You've got the burgundy and gold. If I come in here with a, oh, I would never do that. If someone were to come in here with a burgundy and gold jersey, you would know exactly, oh, they're a Redskins fan. Now, if they came in here with this out of sight silver and blue uh, with stars on, uh, on the shoulders, you say, oh, my God, that's America's team. That's God's team. You know exactly who it is. Jesus said, identify with me in such a way. Listen, in such a way. I, I, I have a problem with Christians who tell me that they just seem like they're happy all the time, happy all the time, happy all the time. I'm blessed and highly favored. I'm walking in the joy of the Lord, and I understand that. I do understand it, but listen, that's not the reality. The reality is that God causes us to go through pain and, and suffering and heartache so that we learn to depend on him. And we're not to run from it. We're to embrace the cross. 
Heard a story about a young, uh, a, a young, a young boy who was wanted to play football, and went to his father and said, "Dad, I want to play football." And he said, his father said to him, "Okay, son, you want to play? All right, I'm going to write a check. When I write this check, son, when I write this check for you to play football, if I pay, you play." What he was saying is, "Son, I'm going to write this check for you to play." But just because things just get a little tough and you start getting hit and you don't like it doesn't mean you can quit. If I pay, you play. But not only, son, if I pay, you play. If I, play you, you, if I pay, you play and you stay. In other words, if you get to a point where you find out, you find that maybe you're not quite as talented as, as some of the other, other guys or, or the coach for whatever reason wants to put in one of the other players and you're on the sideline and you're not getting any playing time, that's not the time to quit. That's not the time to say, I'm through with this. No, son, if I pay, you play and you stay. Listen, my brothers and my sisters, Jesus Christ paid for this thing. And because he paid, you better play. And if you're going to play, you might as well stay. Just because the road gets tough. Just because, you know, I went through some things. And I shared last time I was here. It was very trans. I've always been very transparent. I've got a, a, a testimony that maybe other pastors and preachers uh, don't have. Being a single divorced father of three. And I remember going through maybe what has been the roughest time of my life. I can remember some people turning their backs on me. I can remember people uh, uh, saying, what kind of preacher is he that he would even uh, get a divorce or whatever the case may be. It was hearing a whole bunch of different things. And I remember being angry with God. I remember saying, God, I prayed and prayed and prayed that things would turn out differently. I prayed and prayed and prayed. And God, I feel like you abandoned me. I feel like you just left me to myself. And for a long time, I didn't preach. I didn't stand up. I didn't play the piano at all. I was mad at God. I was angry. Because I felt like in all his power, he could have kept it from happening. And I had a, one of my friends from Alabama call me. My nickname is D Plum. And, and he said, D Plum? And this southern twang, D Plum? I'm coming up there. I've got a wedding to attend. I want you to go to the baseball game with me. And I was like, all right, I'll go. And so we're sitting, we're watching the Nats play. And, and he said to me, D Plum, we got to get you back on the playing field. I'm like, what are you talking about? He said, man, just because things have not turned out the way you want, doesn't mean that God cannot use you. Don't throw in the towel. Embrace the pain. Let God use the pain and move forward. I'm going to come back to that in a minute, but I want to keep going. Jesus said, if any of you want to be my followers, he must turn aside from his selfish ambition. He must take up his cross daily and follow me. Follow me. See, the whole thing about becoming a disciple of Jesus Christ is to so represent him on the earth. To allow him to live his life through us in such a way that people are drawn to him because of what they see in us. But the only way to get there is the only way to get to that point is to learn how to follow him. See, disciples in these day, disciples in the day of Jesus were known as followers because this, this sounds really trite, but it's true. They were known as followers because of how they followed. Stay with me. They were known as followers because of how they followed. They would literally, students would literally, disciples would literally follow their rabbi in such a way they would follow them so closely that people called them dust balls. Because of the sand that would come up from the sandals or the feet of the rabbi. They were followed so closely that the, the sand would, would, would get all over them. They were known, they were called dust balls. They followed so closely. They didn't want to miss a move. 
that the teacher may make. They didn't want to miss something that the teacher would say. They would always keep their eye on them. They would always follow. They would stay so close that they could not miss anything. Jesus is saying, follow me in such a way, follow me in such a way that you learn from me how to live the life that I've called you to live. Listen, you will never be a fully devoted follower of Jesus Christ until you learn how to follow him closely. To live in such a way that you don't take your eyes off of him. It's a close following and it's a continual following that never stops. Just because it gets bad, don't throw in the towel. Just because it gets hard, don't stop following. No, the life that Jesus calls us to is not always easy, but he will lift us up. He says, follow me, follow me, follow me closely and continuously. It never stops. It never stops. It never stops. I've shared this illustration before and because it is, it's the, to me it's the best one, the one that really stands out in my mind. My mother taught me a song when I was little. And uh, my god sister Rhonda stood up and said, she, we, we've known each other since we were kids. I don't know if she knows this song, but my mother taught me a song when I was, when I was little. Uh, there once was a man named Michael Finnegan. Anybody ever heard that? There once was a man named Michael Finnegan. He had whiskers on his chin again. The wind came along and blew them in again. Poor old Michael Finnegan. Begin again. There once was a man named Michael Finnegan. He had whiskers on his chin again. The wind came along and blew them in again. Poor old Michael Finnegan, begin again. There once was a man named Michael Finnegan. He had whiskers on his chin again. The wind came along and blew them in again. Poor old Michael Finnegan, begin again. There once was a man named Michael Finnegan. He had whiskers on his chin again. The wind came along and blew them in again. Poor old Michael Finnegan, begin again. There once was a man named Michael Finnegan. You say, well, when does the song stop? The song doesn't stop. <laughs> The song goes on and on and on and on and on and on and on. And that's the way the Christian life is. Just because things get, get tough, we don't stop. It goes on and on and on and on. Just because things get tough, we don't stop. It goes on and on and on and on. Just because we get tired, we don't stop. It goes on and on and on and on and on. Jesus says, if you want to learn to be my followers, you have to learn how to follow me. Follow closely. Follow continuously. But follow me. Eyes on me. And part of the reason the church is in the the shape that it's in is because we have not learned to follow. I'm going to bring this to a close, but I want to challenge each and every one of us. I want to challenge each and every one of us. If you're a member of Baraka Baraka Baptist Church, I know Pastor Stefan, and I know he set up things for you to learn. If there's Bible study, come to Bible study. If there are small groups, get involved in small groups. There's Sunday school, I know, because I was here. There's Sunday school. Come to Sunday school. Learn. Listen, you will never learn how to follow Jesus Christ until you learn this. And there's too many days, too many days that many of us go without cracking this book open. And there's no way you ever know where to go, the where God will lead you, how he's calling you to follow, what he's calling you to do until you learn his word. The very first thing I said uh, that Jesus wants us to do, what does Jesus want from us, is to turn from our selfish ways. Listen, turn from our selfish ways. Sometimes that selfishness just manifests itself in not wanting to pray, not wanting to read the Bible. And we have to learn sometimes to just turn our clocks ahead just a little bit, turn our alarms up just a little bit so we can get up a little bit early and meet with Jesus. The only way you'll learn how to live this life is to follow him as closely as possible. In closing, let me say this. There was a story uh, about a man named Peter who happened to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. And it's very interesting because in this passage of Scripture, in the parallel passage in Mark, when Jesus said the Son of Man must suffer and must die and will be killed and will be raised again in three days, and Peter said, no, Lord, may it never be. May that never happen to you. Peter said, I'll follow you wherever you want to go, wherever you want me to go, Father, uh, Jesus, whatever it takes, I'll follow you. And Jesus said, really? Really? Well, I need you to know that before the cock crows three times, you will deny me. Fast forward. Jesus gets arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane, and they're taking him on trial. And there's a passage in the scripture that says, Peter followed Jesus from afar. 
Peter was watching what was going on while he was being arrested, while Jesus was being arrested, while he, was, while he had been beaten. He, Jesus, Peter was, was watching all of this. But it's very interesting to me that the scripture says Peter followed from afar. And a few verses later, it said Peter denied the Lord again and the rooster crowed. I guarantee you that at the lowest points of your life, when you find yourself outside of God's will and doing the things that God has called you not to do, I surmise to you and I guarantee if you look at your life at that point, you will say, I have not been following closely. The biggest disappointments in my life came from me opening up the word and giving it out each and every week, giving it out each and every week, giving it out each and every week, giving it out each and every week. But what I was failing to do at this particular point in my life was to get into the word, let the word get into me, and give it out. You can do the very right things the very wrong way. And if you're not careful, you'll begin to drift. And I don't know where you are right now. I don't know most of you here. My challenge to you my challenge to you is to learn to follow Jesus as closely as you can. I really don't even know how, how else to say it. I was trying to think of something deep. It's really not deep. It's very simple. It's very simple. If you want your life to be blessed by God, learn to follow Jesus as closely as you can. Turn aside from your selfish ambitions. Embrace the cross. And learn to follow him closely. And learn to follow him continuously. That's what Jesus wants from you. That's what Jesus wants from me. Father, we thank you. And we bless your name, God. We give you all the praise and glory. And Lord, I don't know. I know sometimes when I'm sitting in the congregation, uh, I want an exciting word. I want to shout. And I want all this. And God, I'm just reminded, thank you, first of all, for telling me to obey you and to preach what you would have me to preach. But I pray, oh God, that this word would settle deep in the hearts of your people who are listening today. I pray that each and every one of us would be not only challenged by this word, but that we would allow this word to change us, that we would be different, God, because we've heard it, not because of what I've said but because of the way you took it and spoke to their heart. Lord, we'll be careful to obey you. We'll be careful to give you all the glory. We love you. We bless your name. All God's people said, amen. amen.